looking at the internal cranial base, so we're looking at a real skull from a superior point of view, firstly, there's just three big fossae. So this is the anterior cranial fossa. This is the middle cranial fossa in the middle, <laughs> aptly named. Here we've got the posterior cranial fossa. So difficult for me to pin, perhaps, because they're big regions, but important for you to know that we can just split the internal surface of the skull up here into anterior, middle, posterior fossae. Then we've got, uh, towards the front, the crista gali. Now remember, this is part of the ethmoid bone. So we've got frontal bone here and here, and then in the midline here, this is the ethmoid bone. And you can see, it's quite beautiful, you can see there's a suture just here, is the end of the ethmoid bone there. So it's only this bit here in the middle. Now this bit that sticks up is the crista gali. And that means rooster's comb, so that bit that roosters have on the top of their head. Someone thought it looked just like that. So that's the crista gali. Now then the flat or horizontal part of the bone is called the cribiform plate. And the cribiform plate has holes in it that you can see there, and they are the olfactory foramina. Now, posterior to the ethmoid bone here, we have part of the sphenoid bone, which looks a little bit like a saddle, if you just look at it the right way and maybe squint. This is the cella tercica, so it's a whole region of the, the bone here. And just to try and help you see how it looks like a saddle, because, you know, of course, it may not be apparent immediately, here's a little person that we have who's agreed to uh, help us. And so if we just sit them there, that's how it's meant to look like a saddle, okay? So the yellow bit here is the person's head. Their lower limbs have gone down either side there of that central part, and their bum is sitting in that central bit in the middle there. Okay, so this is the Turkish saddle, or cella tercica. Now in the middle of that, there is a feature, though. So if there was a pin right here in the middle, what I'd be hoping you would write is hypophyseal fossa. Now the hypophysis is the pituitary gland. It's the old name really for the pituitary gland. One day I reckon the name of this will change to pituitary fossa, but it's that little depression in the middle of the cella tercica. Now unfortunately on this particular skull, this bit here is a bit broken. Now this would normally be sitting up a little higher, which makes this look probably more like a saddle uh, and more like a fossa as well. So that, in the middle, hypophyseal fossa. Now then we have, we can see the jugular foramen. If we tilt the skull this way, oh that's nice. We can see again the irregular shaped jugular foramen there, just either side of the anterior end of the foramen magnum, uh, which, again, we can also see here. And then we have the carotid canal. Now on this skull, I reckon that the roof of the carotid canal, which we can see here, I reckon it's broken and it probably should uh, be bone there. So this is where we can see the carotid canal here, and that's where it's opening. You can see it kind of coming along and joining up with foramen lacerum there. So on this one, it's pretty clear. We can see the carotid canal right there. So it's anterior to this petrous part of the temporal bone. Now if we look a bit anterior to that, we can see here, if we tilt the skull this way, this round opening, which is the internal view that we get of the optic canal that the optic nerve is going to run through. So that's the optic canal there. And then we can have a look at a few other foramina that we can see from this internal point of view. Now firstly, not far, not too far from the optic canal, we can see a foramen here, that's foramen rotundum. So this one here, rotundum. And then we can see one that we saw before from an inferior point of view, foramen ovale, the large oval shaped one. And then we've got foramen spinosum. And then back towards the midline, foramen lacerum. So it goes rotundum, ovale, spinosum, lacerum. And then what we can see here too that's deeply cool are the wings of the sphenoid bone. Now before I try and point them out on here though, let's just have a quick look. 
Here's an individual sphenoid bone looking very much like a spaceship from Star Trek. Uh, and what we can see, if we turn it around so that we're looking at the same point of view as we've got here on the real skull, we can see that there are a couple of wings. So here we've got a greater wing, the larger one, and here you can see it's separate, and it's separated there by the, uh, one of the orbital fissures. Um, here we've got the lesser wing, so it's superior but smaller. So lesser wing, greater wing here. Oh, and on this one, we can see the hypophyseal fossa in the middle of the cella terceca, and this posterior part, the dorsum cello, that you don't have to know, uh, as an individual structure, you can see that's quite tall, and that makes up part of that saddle there, which was broken on the real s on this real skull. But what that means is we can come in here and have a slightly closer look and see some sutures here. So here's the greater wing of the sphenoid bone from this point of view, and you can see where that ends. There's a suture there with the temporal bone. Here's the lesser wing up here, and a little bit of it's broken off here, but here's the lesser wing and there's the suture there between the frontal and sphenoid bone. So lesser wing here, and it's really lovely on this side as well where we can see the suture. So here's the lesser wing and then the greater wing here. So that's the wings of the sphenoid bone. And then we can see, if we zoom out a little bit, we can see that we know there's an external or uh, uh, acoustic meatus or an opening for the external acoustic meatus here. Here we've got an internal opening uh, of the uh, sorry, or the opening of the internal acoustic meatus here. And what do you reckon goes through that? Or at least one of the structures that goes through it. Yeah, which one? Which cranial nerve will go through that? Yeah, well done. It's the vestibular cochlear nerve. So in here, in the petrous part of the temporal bone, we can see, oh sorry, we can't sorry, we can't see, but we know that the middle and inner ears are in here. So the cochlea is in here. So the nerve that takes the sound, the signals that are going to be interpreted as sound to the brain has to come out of the skull somewhere and go into the brain. So this is where the vestibular and cochlear nerves together as the vestibular cochlear nerve will will come into the brain there. Okay, so that's the internal Sorry, the opening of the internal acoustic meatus there. All right, then we've got oh a hypoglossal canal. Now on this skull, it's a little bit tricky to see it amazingly clearly, but you'll have to take my word for it. There's a little tunnel just in there. So we're looking at the foramen magnum here. So just lateral there to the foramen magnum, there's a little canal there. Now you can see it more clearly on this skull if we keep tilting the skull up this way and we actually look, oh there it is, beautiful, up into the foramen magnum from below. So there's the hypoglossal canal there, it's quite clear from that point of view, sorry. So clearer from an inferior point of view than the superior one. That's the hypoglossal canal, no prizes for guessing what goes through that one. Then we've got the cerebellar fossa, now the cerebellum is going to sit right here, so that's the cerebellar fossa, but what could you also call it? Yeah, that's right, the posterior cranial fossa. So it's the same thing. So this is one of those rare I times when there's a structure that has two names that would be correct in the exam. Okay, so if there was a pin here, you could say posterior cranial fossa or you could say cerebellar fossa or both. Either one would be perfectly acceptable and correct. Now then we'll look at a few grooves. Here we've got a groove here just above the cerebellar fossa and it's running across the back of the skull here on the inside, that's the groove for the transverse sinus. Now in this case a sinus is not an airfield space, in this case a sinus is a vein within the skull. So we're looking at a vein running through this groove here. The vein would be the transverse sinus and this is the groove for the transverse sinus. Now the transverse sinus doesn't stay transverse for long, what it does is it goes around a corner and then another corner and then another bend so it makes an S shape here and so this part, the S shaped part is the sigmoid sinus, sigmoid meaning S shaped so 
Once it stops running straight along here, then we're into the sigmoid sinus. Now the sigmoid sinus goes through what? Yeah, it, it runs through the jugular foramen and becomes the internal jugular vein. So this is the sigmoid sinus here, but once it's gone through that hole, it's the internal jugular vein. Then we've got another couple of grooves here, but a bit more anterior. So here we can see there's a lovely little groove here, but then splits and there's a couple of branches that come off it, a couple of grooves off it. Now this is in the petrous part, sorry, this is petrous, the squamous part of the temporal bone here, which is a really thin part and it's quite dangerous uh, and, and near terion here too. Um, so if there's a fracture here, the vessels that are in these grooves can be torn. So these are the grooves for the middle meningeal arteries and they're really quite dangerous because if the bone is broken and the blood vessel torn, bleeding into the inside the skull can cause increased pressure on the brain and the person can actually die. So grooves for middle meningeal arteries here. And then we have clivus which is this slippery dip like bit here behind the cella tercica running down into the foramen magnum. And then we have the anterior clinoid processes which are just here on the lesser wing coming off the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone either side of the cella tercica.